Okay, uh, let's see, I can still make moves. Okay, evening all. Okay, I thought this week we could have a look at some miniatures. So, miniature chess games are games which are often, um, they're usually under 25 moves. So, most often, I think between 20 and 25 moves. These are the size of games. I thought they'd be very interesting um, to look at, and some are very instructive tactically. So let's have a look at, first of all, a game of Mikhail Tell to start things off. So this was in Upsilla 1956. Mikhail Tell was playing black. He was close to the peak of his powers, uh, becoming world champion in 1960, I believe. So he was a fast up and coming star. And this is a fantastic game that I want to show you to start off with. So D4 uh, from Janus, uh, and then Mikhail Tal plays knight f6. After c4, g6, we see a king's engine defense emerging. So the king's engine defense, e4, d6, and now f3 is the Simish variation. Tal castles, bishop e3, and white's usual plan is to play something like queen d2. And then often h pawns useful as well as bishop h6. Tal plays e5, after knight g e2. Now c6, and it looks as though black is interested in possibly breaking open the center with d5 uh, at some point. And in fact, after queen b3, although the queen is exerting an influence over the d5 square, there seems to be a virtual Moroxy bind here against black playing d5. Tal actually, he takes first on d4, and after knight takes d4, he does actually still play d5. The thing to note here is white's king is still in the center, in the danger, if it's still in the center. But this d5 is a very, you know, liberating, powerful liberating move. But can it be proven to be okay in this particular position? Well, white takes on d5. Tau took back. And now e takes d5. And, okay, where is the compensation? Well, you might think rook e8 could be dangerous, but uh, perhaps white just plays something like king f2, and how would the attack proceed? In fact, Tau finds another move here, which is very imaginative indeed, which makes rook e8 actually more effective. If I gave you that as a clue, you want to make rook e8 as effective as possible. So what move would you play here? Uh, if I give you 20 seconds, because there's a Broadcast allow, I usually give 10 on YouTube, but I'll give you 20 seconds. So tell to play, what do you think he played in this position? Any ideas? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to have to show you. Okay, now it's early in the broadcast. So, Tao actually played a remarkable move, knight c6, just sacrificing a whole knight, just to exert more pressure on d4 frontally. White took this, d takes c, and now rook e8 is actually threatening queen takes d4 with this bishop pinned. But you might think, well, what about this defense mentioned before? King f2. Okay, well, it is still slightly different. There is pressure on d4 here on that queen. So how do you think black played from this position? It's absolutely amazing, but Mikhail Tal actually played rook takes e3. So he's drawing uh, the king out uh, potentially here. On king takes e3, which wasn't played, this looks very dangerous indeed. For example, knight g4 check is now exposing an attack on the knight. And this looks extremely dangerous. White didn't actually do this. White tried to def defend with rook d1. But we have knight g4 check anyway. After f takes g4, bishop takes d4, threatening a very nasty you know, discovery attack with check. So white now plays rook takes d4. After queen takes d4, 
White tries to defend this position by playing queen d5. And now another fantastic move, uh, which maybe White didn't expect at all, really crowns the combination. Mikhail Tao used a very powerful discovered and double check mechanism. So there's a double check and a discovered check, giving White very limited options indeed. White took the rook, and now bishop takes g4 check. There's only one square for the king, unless the queen wants to go in front. King e1, and we have now check. Now if the knight moves back, then we just take the queen. We see bishop e2, but alas, the queen is a liability on d5. The move rook takes e2 check forces white to resign. If the king moves, then queen f2 is mate. And if the knight takes, then we just take the queen. So I thought that was quite a startling king's engine defense game. Very aggressive play, dynamic. If we just quickly review that. So the black side of a king's engine defense played in such an energetic manner, breaking the binds, the Moxy kind of bind White had, and then spectacularly sacrificing a knight, just putting more pressure on d4. And this is just too much, it seems, after king f2, this hurricane of sacrifices. Rook takes e3, after rook d1, knight g4 check, so basically exerting influence on d4 with the bishop. Bishop takes d4. Perhaps this isn't the best defensive try, but um, it was tried. Queen d5, and it just fell to rook e2 check. So a wonderful attacking display by Mikhail Tal. So 1956. Let's have a look at another interesting miniature. So this time we'll go to 1946 Mar, Mar de Plata tournament. And the players, uh, let's try and load it in. Okay, the players playing white, Cesar Juan Corte against Jacobo Bolboshin. So 1946, we see E4, E5. Knight f3, knight c6. We see bishop c4, bishop c5. And now white tries to construct a center very quickly with the move c3. Knight f6, d4. This is a gambit now because after check, knight c3, white is offering that center pawn. Black takes it here, and white just casually castles. So a very common idea is used here that after knight takes c3, b takes, bishop takes c3, white can play a very powerful sacrifice, exposing the king still in the center. Bishop a3, stopping the king from castling. Black didn't greedily take on a1. He thought maybe he could play d5 and bishop e6 to shield his king frontally. So d5. White played bishop b5. And now black took the rook. Bishop takes rook. Okay, so still pretty dangerous. Check, bishop e6. And white didn't waste time now taking on a1. That might give black, you know, valuable time to maybe castle queen side. Instead, we see queen a4. So threatening very dangerous bishop takes c6 which will be winning the rook, you know, after taking check, queen d7, we'd win the rook. So the rook gets out of the way with rook b8. But now we see knight e5, putting more pressure on c6. Queen c6, white takes on c6, takes, queen takes c6, king d8. And now a startling move, little combination here, very, very powerful, which black must have overlooked. I wonder if you can spot it so white to play here, if I give you 20 seconds starting from now, what would you play as white?
Okay, it's not bishop e7. Uh, someone hinting at it almost. Okay, it's knight takes f7. Well done to those who spotted this. There's only one move here for black to take, and now bishop e7 is checkmate. So a sparkling game there in this gamut from white. Often it's the case that um, you know gambits put huge amounts of pressure on the opponent in, in compensation for the material. So this game was no different from that pattern. Let's have a look at another. This time let's go to Berlin, Germany, 1929. Wolfgang Heidenfeld was playing white against Zietemann playing black. So Berlin, Germany, 1929. E4, E5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, white castles, knight f6. And now get another sort of gambit. So Kasparov has said, you know, material is balanced in chess with quality of pieces and time. So gambiting here to get quality and time. So d4, black took with bishop takes d4. We see knight takes d4, knight takes d4. And now we see f4 being played, trying to wrench open this f file. Knight c6. And now the very energetic bishop takes f7 check. Black doesn't really want to step in uh, to any trouble here uh, with king takes. He instead cautiously plays king f8. White plays f takes e5, knight takes e5, and the bishop drops back. So it looks as though black is in trouble though. It's not good to have a knight pinned on f6 and the king not able to castle. d6, bishop g5, bishop g4, attacking the queen. The queen now goes to d2. From d2, f4 is a very good square to put more pressure on f6. So king e7, queen f4. We see rook f8. And now h3, bishop d7. And now knight c3, and it looks as though knight d5 is very powerful. So that stopped with c6. Rook a d1, just building up pressure on d6 here, is very, very interesting indeed. Because now after h6, white plays a very, very surprising continuation, a shocking continuation. Can you spot the first move of this shocking continuation? If I give you 10 seconds, sorry, 20 seconds starting from now. So white play here, what would you do? Any ideas? Okay, it's rook takes d6. Now, black in the game actually played queen b6 check. Um, now, if the king just, just took here, this is uh, quite dangerous indeed, in any case, in this position. Uh, maybe just check could be potentially dangerous unless the king's escaping. But let's have a look first at the game continuation. So it was actually check, king h1, and now the king taking here. But you'll note in this position, b6 is an occupied square, and white plays a spectacular move to stop the king with any ambitions from reaching c8 and running away. Can you guess what white played? In this position, it looks as though the attack um, might be uh, not that convincing. You know, if you played check, you know, maybe the king's going to run c8. So, what would you do in this position if 
I give you 20 seconds starting from now. Okay, uh, an amazing idea. Queen takes e5 check is played. After king takes, now we see bishop f4 check. There's very limited moves because this bishop's on this diagonal. So the king goes to d4, and now we see rook d1 check. And it's very, very cruel now after king c5. Bishop d6 check is mate. The king's got no escape, it's been mated. But one wonders, okay, let's just rewind there and just be a bit cynical about this. Queen b6 didn't help the cause. I wonder if this still works on king takes d6. I'd be concerned if this works here on check. If we follow with the key difference, black's got b6, would that make a difference? I think it might. Might not it? Mind you, check. And here isn't bishop e3 dangerous? This is king b4. It's a bit tricky. Maybe check here. This would seem to be mating anyway. Ouch. So it does seem to work even without queen b6. That seems pretty convincing, doesn't it? Uh, so here, bishop e3, there's not too many choices. Check looks as though that's forcing a mate. If king c5 here, I think we can just, uh, that looks as though the black king shouldn't survive. <laughs> uh, if we try rook takes d7, King b4, is the black king surviving? Rook takes b7, surely not. So this needs precision, this position. I don't know, does anyone see a combination here? Have I gone wrong? Let's have a look here. So bishop takes f4 check. Sorry, bishop f4, rook d1, bishop e3, I had that variation and I had this other variation though, um, after the check just king c5, thank you, someone on Twitch, excellent, there's an excellent move here which just ends black very neatly in two moves. Can you spot it? So another test here. Uh, okay, I'll just say actually, well, well done. Um, rook d5 double check. And that stops the king. The king hasn't got b5 or anything. It's cut off on the fifth rank. So now if king b4, we just end with a3. Well done. So that'll be checkmate there. So pretty, pretty amazing little game there. Let's have a look at another one. So Paul Cares, the crown prince of chess, playing C.H. Alexander, a British player, in 1954. So I've got a vast diversity of games here, going around time and location. So Paul Cares, uh, e4, e5. After knight f3, we see knight f6. Petrov defense. Knight takes e5, d6. Knight f3, knight takes e4, d4, d5, bishop d3. It looks as though black's playing very solidly, maybe trying to draw with black. And it looks all pretty standard stuff so far in the Petrov. c3, knight f6, bishop g5. We've got almost like we've got a symmetrical pawn structure. Queen d7, black has ambitions though to castle queenside to make things quite interesting. So knight bd2. Now black castle queen side. Queen a4. 
queen a4 is played and we see h6 and now black starts to play aggressively after bishop h4 thinking that surely this is useful for some sort of kingside attack so g5 uh, one problem with pawn moves uh, which is profoundly important to note about pawn moves and weaknesses of the last move when you move a pawn forward uh, you're losing control of squares but also you know potentially diagonals are slightly loosened you know you've got looser pieces on diagonals every time you move a pawn forward or you could be even weakening uh, across every time you move a pawn forward so this g5 it looks as though it shouldn't be a, a losing move at any point in the game but watch out for the implications of g5 later on it's profound we see bishop g3 black plays now bishop takes f3 volunteering the light square bishop which could be uh, have tactical implications later as well just giving white's bishop free free reign on the light squares after the knight takes f3 g4 is played so the idea here is that surely knight e5 is not possible because knight e5 and we're attacking the queen and we're defending our own queen so surely knight e5 is a move we'd rule out isn't it so would you rule out knight e5 and if i gave you 20 seconds here is that a, a ridiculous move or not so 20 seconds to work out can you actually play knight e5 here or not I think actually this is a bit of a hard question you have to see a fantastic resource to justify this okay now you might have had the wrong reason here because there looks to be an obvious reason about a7 right so you might be thinking knight e5 and the idea you might uh, you might be thinking I'm, I'm asking you is if queen takes a7 now if we if we have this position what about knight c6 where is where is the mating attack here there's no mating attack here is that because of queen a8 knight b8 surely that's the case there's no mating attack correct but what can white play here which is absolutely amazing totally amazing move here so you might have thought just because of a7 that's not true so if we if we take the knight we just lose the queen you know the queen's attacked here okay just just bear with me just make sure everyone's there so it looks as though it's losing a piece but what can white play in this position which is utterly amazing not rook takes e5 nope okay <clears throat> yes an utterly amazing move bishop f5 so it's a double piece sacrifice so it's luring the queen like a magnetic force to the f5 square so queen takes f5 and then the queen is kicked around a bit rook takes e5 and here it's a lot more dangerous to play queen d7 now i believe because uh, queen takes a7 there's no there's no defensive knight here this is a very big difference indeed you know for example if c6 then we've got you know things like rook takes e7 maybe or even stronger no pardon me just maybe check actually what do we have here let's have a look What, what would we play in this position on c6 
may, maybe just check we've got we've got the discovered check which looks really powerful in any case um, maybe just rook takes d7 is enough here for an advantage or well, they could be even stronger um, sorry someone said queen a8 check yeah I think rook takes e7 looks good just to get the material back with with interest so but um no okay in the game black actually tried queen d3 so he's trying to keep his king maybe having that d7 on taking as an escape square uh but we see rook takes e7 now on c7 it's very dangerous okay rook d7 and now actually uh we see rook e3 just attacking the queen <laughs> and this is the punchline we're coming to the punchline here that it looks as though well hasn't the queen isn't the queen just defending the punchline now is that white simply <laughs> can you guess what white plays now to simply win this position if i give you 20 seconds here starting from now to go material up white's play and win any ideas I mean you have to switch mode of thought now away from <laughs> away from the king safety to something else yes just taking on a6 is actually really bad for black because of bishop e5 ouch black would have to give up the exchange here with rook d6 just being the exchange down is, is horrible so black actually resigned here so i thought that was a surprising combination and actually knight e5 if we go back um seemed quite an amazing concept it wasn't as simple as one would expect uh, knight e5 here amazing then actually bishop f5 uh, so the critical thing um you know black's king safety is is shot to pieces so we had a quick look at this line i can't really see too many defensive resources available against queen a8 check if we did pursue this discover check line um i think you know this position at minimum looks very good for white uh he's two pawns up here at minimum and there's probably something stronger there with embarrassing which is an easy uh an easier mate um the thing that concerns me about rookie seven though is that the king can wiggle out with d7 here so one has to be you know careful uh, that's why I'm just going as a, as a minimum example just winning two pawns in that case but the Queen went to d3 so and here you you might think um, okay after Rook takes e7 Rook d7 um, well the Rooks the Rooks hanging so there's no time for this because this gives gives the King d7 square and if white had played Rook takes d7 uh, then knight takes d7 and you know, there's no problems you know the knights now got b8 uh, it's not as problematic so what was actually played was gaining another key tempo and not minding even the queen coming back is this lethal skewer here so it's quite interesting um, way of winning there let's have a look at another game so that was Paul Kaz the crown prince of chess one of the strongest players never to become world champion now we're gonna have a look at one of the strongest ever British players um, who actually uh, in one of the Olympiads actually defeated Mikhail Tal Mikhail Tal has rarely lost in Olympiads but anyway he was one of the top British players of the time this is in the Hastings tournament of 1957-8 so it's towards the end of 1957 and January 1958 we see Dr Jonathan Penrose as white playing Max Bloor so e4 e5 we see d4 he takes c3 so a gambit knight c6 knight f3 now black plays knight f6 e5 
knight g4 c takes d4 it looks very pleasant for white even though the gamut's been declined uh, bishop b5 bishop d7 knight c3 knight e7 and white just castles here c6 and so the bishop drops back queen c8 trying to just maybe parry this this dangerous looking bishop rook e1 bishop e6 now knight g5 so white's interested perhaps in winning that bishop so g6 so white takes that bishop off queen takes e6 so again actually like the previous game we've got a bishop which has no opposition on the light squares so how dangerous is this piece going to be here bishop g5 is played h5 now queen b3 queen d7 rook e2 bishop g7 so is black simply going to castle and he might have a good position you know if if the knight's kicked it can go to h6 but now queen a3 keeps the black king in the center you don't want to lose e7 here so black has got a problem after queen a3 plays b6 which doesn't look too helpful maybe there are better moves than he could have played here rather than b6 uh, i guess the idea would have been maybe to castle queenside with the queen protecting a7 um you know maybe after the bishop moves uh protecting this then castling queenside possibly but we see now e6 being played uh, which has a fantastic idea in mind after f takes e6 there's pressure which there wasn't now that that rook on the e file but how can this be exploited so an absolutely crushing move in this position which you might not think at all about uh, what would you play here with white if i gave you 20 seconds starting from now So white's play. And sorry, just just for the record, um, if we just abstract, for, we got two examples with a similar feature. We got an unopposed bishop in that cares game from just earlier. Remember the magnetic effect of that bishop in relation to the opponent's queen. That's a slight clue for this combination here as well. Fantastically, we have a similar theme and that's purely accidental. I was selecting some miniatures, but this bishop does have a magnetic effect on the queen as part of this combination. So white to play. None of you are getting anywhere near it at the moment. What white played in this position is perhaps a bit too spectacular to be believed. But I've given you a clue. There's an unopposed bishop. So you can think combinationally in the extreme now an unopposed bishop on the light squares and you've also got the queen on the light square as well on d7 it's knight b5 wasn't played but it looks tempting it's on the right sort of uh, track I'm going to have to show you. It was actually knight takes d5. Whatever way black plays this is a disaster. If queen takes d5, then we just play queen takes e7, mate. If e takes, then of course, you know, rook takes e7 is a disaster. If c takes, then we play similar to the game we've just seen, an unopposed bishop on the light squares. We play bishop b5. And if queen takes, then queen takes e7. So knight takes d5. Doesn't le really leave uh, too many defenses here. It's it's another piece going on e7. Black played knight f5. And oh, pardon me. And, and white just played 
bishop takes f5 and resigns here if g takes then it's quite easy you know something like rook takes e6 looks absolutely crushing you know because of taking a knight c7 so after bishop takes f5 in fact black resigned so the moral of these two stories just shown is that if you give an attacking player a light square bishop which is unchallenged it can act as a magnet <laughs> to pieces like the queen yeah, as part of combinations so unopposed light square bishops are pretty dangerous to attacking players just on the last two examples uh, let's have a look at another game so Milner Barry another great British player I believe playing against Veiko Hanninen in the uh, Moscow Olympiad of 1956 uh, so he he's famous for his gambit in the French defense I think Milner Barry is in the French defense so but this wasn't a French defense uh, let's see anyway so e4 e5 actually it's a Vienna game which is an interesting surprise weapon if you play especially blitz chess and what surprise weapon away from the royal pairs after d5 you're supposed to now take with f takes e this is very theoretical knight takes e4 d3 after takes takes this is very theoretical d4 and now this gambit knight f3 encouraging black to take here because you you can establish your center but black played c5 bishop e2 bishop e7 both sides castle queen e1 and there's a crude plan here just you know targeting g7 uh, but black um, has kind of disconnected white's pawns from each other and this looks as though it should give black a good position just to play f6 we see queen g3 f takes e5 uh, but now bishop h6 is surprisingly played anyway and there's a fantastic reason why this is possible i i thought it was pretty fantastic when i was reviewing this game because i played similar positions i would never have thought of this really uh, so bishop f6 looks as though you know white surely can't take here he's going to end up losing the bishop surely he did take on e5 has he just blundered has Milner Barry just blundered here? Bishop takes e5, Queen takes e5. There's a huge problem in this position. A huge problem. I wonder if in the game uh, Rook f6 was played. But just to demonstrate the problem here. Let's let's go with G takes H six. What would you play here with White? If I gave you twenty seconds here, White's play is this peace sacrifice justified in this position? <clears throat> Any ideas? White's play here. Well, okay, I'll make it easier. I think I'm going to make it easier. I would reject bishop f3. I would reject this, right? Because rook takes f3. But you're on the right path. Um, I think just personally, I play rook takes f8 and not care about the queen coming to f8. You play rook f1. And why wouldn't you need to care? Well, one reason, queen g7, queen e8 is mating. So the queen moves here and then we've got that mentioned bishop f3 and it's just so dangerous this bishop d5 check because the queen and bishop are operating in a very complementary manner here how is bishop d5 actually stopped in this position it seems very very powerful bishop d5 so the point of the peace sacrifice it seems 
to weaken this diagonal. Pawns of the soul of chess, that g takes h6 actually weakens this diagonal, which is very dangerous when a queen is sitting there, accompanied by a bishop on d5. Uh, so this is this looks to be all over, and I haven't really engine checked this game, but it just looks to be all over this position. Uh, this combination is just lethal. So this is why perhaps Black chose here to play Rook f6, but the attack continues very very powerfully. In any case, Black continues with Bishop takes g7, and. Uh, it's it's bad news. Uh, Black tries rook e6. We see queen h5, leaving the bishop hanging again because of this rook f7 is is too dangerous. Queen e7, bishop h6, and now you know we've got a threat of rook f8 check. So knight d7 protecting f8. Bishop g4 now, rook e5, queen h3, knight b6. Which has a weakness of the last move here. It's not on f8. So rook f8 check wins the queen. Takes takes takes. Queen takes h7. Black resigned. Was there anything else? Is knight d7 really necessary? Uh, it looks as though white has a strong position. Uh, perhaps. Uh, the key threat might be just taking and then queen g3. Um, if we if we try say this, you know, which might actually potentially be an attempt at something, and I think we just play queen g3 check. Well, this looked I thought this might have looked dangerous, but maybe not. Pardon me. Okay, I'm gonna have to give you a pop quiz here. How does white win this if a5? Let's just take this as an example instead of knight b6. What would white play? If I give you 20 seconds here, I'll try and work it out as well. So white to play and win here. Ah, um, Queen G3 is a suggestion. That looks good, Queen G3. Queen Queen G3 looks looks dangerous. Um, also, just the what Black's actually doing now. Is there any other ideas? Queen G3. Okay, so King H8. Let's go with King H8. And what's the knockout blow here? So someone's saying about my line. Pardon me. So I I mentioned takes check. And someone said to play rook. Can't play rook e1 here. Oh, hang on, there's rook f7. Oh, that's pretty dangerous. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Bishop takes d7 first, queen g3, king h8. What's the suggestion? Hmm. Yeah, okay, uh, this is a mystery. So a5, is there any clear way of cracking this? Or should we leave it, uh, <laughs> just assume that this is uh, bishop e6. Nope. Try and look at forcing moves, bishop f4. I'm not entirely sure. Um, 
Okay, I'll leave that. If, if you come back to me on that, someone comes back to me on that. Right, let's. Should we go on to another game? Uh, or. Yeah. Okay, Paul Kaz against Robert Wade in 1954. So, this is an interesting uh, French defense game. Paul Kaz, 1954 London tournament. E4, E6. And we see D4, D5. Knight C3, Knight F6. Bishop G5. Bishop e7, and white is now playing the Alekhine Chatard gambit with h4. So, this is an interesting gambit. Uh, just offering a pawn here, getting this h file. So, queen takes g5, knight h3, a dangerous weapon of choice. I've played this myself in some over the ball games with good success, actually. Queen e7, knight f4, black tries a6 here. Now we see queen g4. King f8, queen f3 actually threatens now knight g6 check because we've got this pin on f7 and h7. So king g8, bishop d3 is played, and now c5. And now a very neat idea indeed. Uh, this would be a difficult combination to kind of fathom. Uh, yeah, it's actually bishop takes h7 check, rook takes, rook takes, king takes, drawing the king out at the cost of an entire rook. And white just castles queen's side now, so he's getting ready for the other rook to come in. We've got some congestion over here to exploit. Black tries f5. Maybe hoping for some sort of defense with knight f8 if h7 is the problem. So after the check, king g8. But white is not going for queen uh, h5. You know, maybe knight f8, possibly. But there's an absolutely crushing move here instead. So white sacrificed the rook. Can you spot the winning move, the final winning move here? If I give you 20 seconds starting from now. <clears throat> what would you play here? Okay, this is kind of easier to calculate than the previous. Yeah, rook h8 check was the final winning move. So the point is that if you know king f7, then we are mating with queen h5. And if takes, uh, we just win the queen. And that's enough. In, in fact, uh, even the bishop might be in a little bit of trouble actually as well. We're winning the bishop after as well. It's with check. So this was a neat game just showing how the dangers of this h file. This, this bishop d3. It looks as though black was trying to block the center. Just in time now we see bishop takes h7. So, so it's taking just so quick the attack here. So effective. So that's Paul Kaz again. Fantastic tactically. Okay. Uh, this is uh, a kind of interesting game from one perspective, I thought. Um, someone called Kilian against Bukuti Gudengoys uh, in Rosdov, USSR 1958. Um, Gurgengoys, Gurgengoys. I'm not going to pronounce that correctly, but it's a variation in the Karakon that he's put his name to. Um, Gurg and he's okay. So anyway, but he doesn't play the Karakon in this game. So that's pointless trivia. So he plays actually g6, d4, bishop g7, knight c3, c6. So Killian playing white plays bishop c4, b5, bishop drops back, b4. That's ignored queen f3, crude. Knight f6, knight goes to e2. Black castles, 
now we see e5 knight e8 and white goes on a caveman adventure now with h4 pardon me h4 so it looks as though this this looks pretty dangerous to open up the lines want to open up the lines with h5 and hg so black tries to blunt this bishop with d5 but h5 is played anyway f6 and now trying to exploit the queen on f3 isn't this rather silly that this is going to liberate the rook here h takes g ignoring that f takes queen h5 and black's not too worried here knight f6 black wants white to close up the lines with g takes white's refusing to do that moves moves the queen back to h4 but we see the whole center now collapsing e takes d4 you know black's getting a lot of center surely bishop h6 now this is just taken queen takes h6 e5 look at black center is the attack has the attack got any steam left in it we see knight f3 queen e7 and here is the first surprising shocking move which uh, dispels the myth about the center what does white play in this position if i give you 20 seconds starting from now white to play Any ideas? No ideas yet? Okay, and the queen's kind of a bit loaded up on h7. Um, knight takes e5. Because now. If queen takes e5, which wasn't played, white would have g takes, which is actually much more effective than before because of this rook hanging here. You know, if king, we just take the rook. So the queen is actually defending f8, really, in this position. So it's trying to distract the queen away from f8 because of g takes. So black is probably annoyed with this and plays bishop f5. Now the knight's just supported with f4. And now black really cracks up, probably really annoyed already. After knight d7, just dropping c6, that's taken. Ouch. Queen e3. And now another horrible thing happens in this position, which spells the end of black. Can you guess what white plays? In this position and why that's so effective now as well so white to play if i give you 20 seconds starting from now yeah it's interesting that you know certain moves weren't so effective but in the right circumstances they are and in this case, bishop takes d5 is really uh, all over. Because if king h8, we play g7, mate. If knight takes d5, we just you know play queen takes f h7. So it seems, yeah, that's that's all over after bishop takes d5. Uh, okay, so uh, let's have a look at another sweet little game. So. Ah, this is very interesting indeed. This is H.I. Wolverton against another British player. Um, I think they're both British players. David Breen Pritchard, London, 1959. So we see the Albin counter gambit in this game. So C4, E5, one of my favorites in Blitz. Takes D4, Knight F3, Knight C6. This has got an unexpected twist at the end. Very, very interesting. Uh, A3, annoying move indeed. Knight G E7. So is black trying to collect E5? Yes. 
usually g3 knight g6 bishop g2 bishop g4 and now black sometimes has this idea it's castle queen side like this the castle's queen d7 queen c2 bishop e7 b4 and there's a ready made attack you know with b5 on the queen side there's black dare castle actually no he doesn't he plays rook d8 doesn't castle queen side b5 knight c takes e5 knight takes knight takes bishop f4 and actually a rather remarkable concept here seemingly playing with fire I'm not entirely sure how sound this game is it's just a remarkable game that's for sure because the king's still in the center and you shouldn't really be doing active operations with your king still in the center nevertheless d3 is played uh, white took this so he's slightly weakened f3 knight takes d3 but the king's still in the center isn't this a snag surely you don't do this stuff with your king in the center because you're going to get really badly punished and in fact bishop takes b7 now threatens well threatens now bishop c6 surely skewing the queen so surely black has to castle no does black have to castle Uh, <laughs> I, I can't believe this finish is this is unbelievable this position um, so black to play what would you play with black if I give you 20 seconds starting from now Any ideas? Black to play. What would you play then? Anyone? Okay, the follow up is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I don't know, actually, I haven't engine checked this game. It's just the aesthetics, though, appeal to me. So black plays knight takes f4, inviting seemingly dangerous skewer. So bishop c6. Now black plays knight e2 check. So we see king g2. And where is the checkmate? Where is the checkmate? <laughs> this is brilliant oh this is priceless oh this really is sorry yeah what does black play in this position now if I give you 20 seconds here Uh, I think someone's on the right track actually. Oh, there does seem to be another viable move in any case. Uh, so there's a mention of Bishop h3. I'm not sure Bishop h3 does anything. Free could have men mentioned Bishop h3 for some reason. On Bishop h3, aren't we just losing our queen to King h1? What's the continuation here? We've just still got our queen skewered, surely. Is that not the case? I haven't really checked it. I mean, this is a brilliant combination as well. No, the uh, bishop f3 looks as though that's that's good. Uh, with the idea that you know knight d4 check and we can win the queen. But even better to make bishop f3 even better is just playing queen takes c6 
check. So it takes and now bishop f3 check. Uh, but haven't we lost the queen? You know, isn't h3 an escape here? So if king takes, okay, knight, okay, we can think knight d4 is, is going to be favorable to black. Uh, so, but the king has got h3 here. King h3. But in this position, black now, you know, it's still without castling, all this without castling. Just plays rook d6, threatening the vicious rook h6. Mating. White tries queen d2, just offering the queen. Uh, but now g5, refusing the queen and just threatening g4, mate. So all this, see that general rule about having to do active operations before you castle was the position broke the general rule, which sometimes happens in chess. So black undertook a lot of active operations, not really caring uh, about this skewer, even to his king, because calculation outweighed it, you know, check just brute force calculation queen takes c6 bishop f3 amazing amazing stuff horrible forcing moves and absolutely forcing a mate with no um, no chance for white at all oh, i thought that was pretty cute that game so um <clears throat> okay uh this game of david bronstein next uh one of my favorite players i've got his book so the Sorcerer's Apprentice, I'd recommend that. So this is Ravinsky against David Bronstein, Moscow, 1953. Let's have a look at this one. And this is interesting as well because it's in the King's Engine Defense Fincetto variation, which usually you'd think white gets a lot of King's safety uh, in this line. Um, so Bronstein played it like this. He closed up the Queen side with C5 and actually got a very nice looking attacking position in any case going for knight h5 and quick f5 after f3 a6 a3 f4 and white tries to block things up keeping solid on the king side knight f6 and now bishop e1 lending support for king safety surely so does white have to worry h5 now g5 is played and this you know is going to support that g5 pawn surely to gain more space if knight h7 isn't black going to just be squashed after h4 this could be strategically lost for white this position because uh un unless black's going to consider a sacrifice here it looks a bit dubious but white could if given time just break open the queen side but what we see instead is a very imaginative move knight g4 uh which you know the knight's threatening uh to come in here g g5 is attacked so this is taken h takes g4 and now this is a dislocated pawn uh, because of the en passant so if it's two pawns it starts to gain momentum this attack but h4 is played anyway uh, after g takes bishop takes h3 check king h1 now king f7 and there's a lovely attack building up on the h file just at the cost of the knight so rook f3, rook h8, knight g1, knight f6, a lot of pressure on h3, b4 is played, that's just taken, a takes, now bishop takes h3, knight takes h3, queen g4 is pretty nasty on h3, and white tries to defend with queen d3 laterally, uh, but here it's horrible after knight h7. Um, unfortunately for white, knight g5 is really, really powerful in this particular position. White actually resigns here in light of knight g5. So that was quite a nice King's Engine defense game. Uh, miniature 25 moves is pushing the miniature. Uh, so, but still 25 moves. So 20 to 25 moves a miniature. Let's have a look at one last game from Mikhail Botvinnik this time against um, a very famous French defense player, Ullman. Um, 
one of the greatest exponents of the French defence as our last game. So this game was played in the German Olympiad in 1958. So Ormond playing white d4, Bobnik plays e6, so he's inviting a French defence. That's rejected, just c4, knight f6, and we go into a Nimzo engine. e3, b6, bishop d3, bishop b7, knight f3, and Bobnik plays knight e4, off the castles f5, queen c2, and now doubles white's pawns and castles rook b1, and now keeps the blockade on these double pawns a4. And it looks as though this is formatic to play a5 and trying to, you know, at least use this pressure. We see queen c7, a5, d6, knight d2. This is taken, takes knight d7, rook b2. And what would you play here with black? An interesting move, actually, to consider if you're ever on the black side of this in the Nimza engine in this sort of position. So black to play. What do you think Botvinnik played here? If I give you 20 seconds starting from now. It's a, it's a critical juncture. So black to play. I'm not entirely sure. This is a bit of a trick question because it looks as though I might ask you to attack the king like this. Well, actually, that sometimes is thematic, but actually b takes a5 is played in this particular position, giving the knight that b6 square. And this is really quite dangerous for white. We see rook a1, knight b6. So on the c, c4 square, rook takes a5, uh, which does seem to be justified tactically to play this. Or is it? Is it some sort of, I mean, because knight takes c4, all we do is just take that knight and then take on b7. So th that would leave white winning. So rook takes a5, isn't this dangerous for a7 now? We see bishop e4, so it's all about c4 all of a sudden. Getting rid of the defense on c4. This is taken, f takes. And now we're really threatening knight takes c4. So we see queen b3 defending c4. And white now is falling victim to knight takes c4 anyway. But he, he treats this as an exchange sacrifice. Queen takes c4, queen takes a5. Because he thinks he's going to get a few pawns here. Queen takes e6 check, king h8. And now throws in because black's actually threatening queen a1 he throws in rook a2 we see queen c7 and he he was looking forward to winning this pawn is this the tail end of the combination he's going to win this pawn and it should be enough for the exchange so he plays queen takes e4 but guess what black plays which is the final move of the game black to play I'll give you 20 seconds, the last 20 seconds of the evening. Nicole Bobnik plays. Can anyone see it? <laughs> okay, Queen F7 actually just hits 
a2 coincidentally in f2 and white has to resign oh, that's bad news if we just go for a back row mate if this sort of thing happens just the back row mate would finish the game here okay and on that note i hope you enjoyed this weird and wonderful selection of miniatures and got something out of them a little bit it'll be on youtube at youtube.com kings crusher if you want to check out the video again and there's that position uh milner was it milner berry which is quite tricky to work out it seems anyway probably something simple if you want to leave a note on that video on youtube okay thanks very much have a good week see you next week thanks very much